Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fall 2020 Population Health Collaborative Meeting. I am Suzanne Lawson with Constellation Consulting, and we are the convener for the collaborative. The Population Health Collaborative is funded by the New Mexico Department of Health Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention Program. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. Attendees, cameras, and microphones are activated today. Um, however, we do ask that you keep your microphones muted during our presentations. Following each of today's presentations, we will have time for Q&A, and you may ask your questions live or post your questions in the chat window, and I'll facilitate those questions, um, the Q&A for everyone. Also, if you would like to make sure that you are added to the collaborative email list, please enter your email address, email address in the chat window, or feel free to email me directly at Suzanne at constellationnm.com. And now, Kenny, I will turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for, for being with us. Um, I'm extremely excited for today. So the Population Health Collaborative has been in existence for several years. Um, it was it started under our 1305 federal funding, and we've had some longtime partners like WVU, WISAC, Loveless, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting someone else, Comagine. Uh, have been long-standing partners of ours, so thank you to all of them. Uh, before we get into the introductions, I just wanted to share a little bit about what our vision is for the Population Health Collaborative. Uh, it really is an opportunity for engagement, collaboration, and, and really making a difference uh, in New Mexico uh, as it pertains to uh, heart disease and stroke and reducing that burden. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in New Mexico. Um, each of our meetings is going to address a different goal of the program, and we hope that through these meetings you all can learn from one another, get some ideas, and think of how you can take some of these um, strategies back into your organization. Um, and so I also wanted to um, give a special thanks. I know we have some folks uh, from health systems, uh, some folks who are doing some frontline work, and we really appreciate one, you taking the time to come. Uh, we realize the pandemic has stretched healthcare resources in the state thin, uh, and, and we thank you for your continued um, collaboration and for all of your work. And I just really wanted to give a shout out to everyone who's, who's assisting with the pandemic response. Um, and uh, as Constellation, as Suzanne said, Constellation Consulting is convening our Population Health Collaborative for this year. And so I will turn it back over to Suzanne. Thanks, Kenny. Um, before we begin today's presentations, we do want to make sure that you all have the opportunity to know who else is attending the meeting today. So I will call on you as you are on my screen. And if you can share your name, title, and the heart disease and stroke prevention project or contract that you are working on, or um, if you are not tied to a contract or um, heart disease and stroke prevention uh, project, if you can share um, how your work is tied to that of the Population Health Collaborative, that would be great. Um, so Cecil, I will start with you and you are currently muted. Hello, I'm uh, Cecil Pollard from West Virginia University School of Public Health. Um, our organization, the Office of Health Services Research, as Kenny mentioned, have been longtime partners with this, uh, with the collaborative. And um, we're doing a lot of work with um, the health systems, Oops. Doing with the health systems and uh, working with EHR and quality improvement data. Thanks, Cecil. Um, Terry, I will come to you now. Terry Stewart. Oh, you're muted. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Terry Stewart. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at Synchronous, um, formerly the New Mexico Health Information Collaborative, or NIMHIC. And we are new to this collaborative because we will be working with the Department of Health on the stroke prevention and blood pressure um, contract. We are in the midst of working on that contract um, as we speak. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Sandy, good to see you. Yeah, you too. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Adendakos, um, and I'm here um, because I'm 
uh, on the board of the New Mexico Community Health Worker Association. So I'm filling in for Maria Otero today and her um, work involves training uh, community health workers. Awesome, thanks Sandy. And Joshua? Josh from the Heart Association? Hello, yes, so sorry. Um, Joshua Martinez here, Community Impact Director for the American Heart Association. Um, and I'm sorry, what, do, what else did you want to know? Um, how your work ties into the, public, uh, the Population Health Collaborative. Okay, yeah, so thank you again so much for inviting me to this. I'm, I'm uh, learning a little bit about what you all uh, are doing, but uh, of course, we, we definitely do a lot of work uh, around population health across the state of New Mexico as it relates to heart disease and stroke. Um, working a lot with uh, around blood pressure, specifically, uh, we have specific programs uh, with self monitoring blood pressure. So, really excited to be a part of this today and see um, what you all uh, are, are working on and uh, how we can work together. So, thank you so much. Thanks, Josh. Um, we'll go on to April. Hi, I'm April Salisbury. I am, uh, like Terry, I am with Synchronous, which is formerly known as NIMHIC, the statewide HIE, and we are brand new. And uh, so we'll be working with the Department of Health on their uh, blood pressure stroke prevention program as well. Thanks, April. And Adam? Yeah, hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Great to be here. Um, so Adam Baus, I work with Cecil Pollard and Samantha Shali Brzozowska in the Office of Health Services Research at West Virginia University School of Public Health. Um, specific to this, you know, we're here to support Kenny and everybody in terms of helping to grow and sustain the Population Health Collaborative. And we do a fair amount of work with health systems when it comes to helping them use their data for quality improvement. So. Um, Great to meet the partners at Synchronous as well. Be nice to exchange notes and get to know your work better. So thanks. Awesome, thank you. And Humphrey? Hi, um, I'm Humphrey Costello. I'm a research scientist with WISAC, which is the Wyoming Survey, Survey and Analysis Center at the University of Wyoming. Um, and despite the name, we are an evaluation group uh, and we provide external evaluation services to several programs programs within the New Mexico Department of Health, including heart disease and stroke prevention and diabetes prevention. Thanks, Humphrey. And Elizabeth, good to see you again, too. Is that me, Elizabeth Foley? It is. Hello, um, Elizabeth Foley. I'm with MCD Public Health. We're a public health institute. Um, our headquarters is in Maine, but we work across the nation and across the globe bringing training and, and technical assistance. And we've been working with the um, New Mexico Department of Health, bringing training, specifically online trainings for a lot of their healthcare providers and community health workers. We have a, um, a robust online community health worker training that has nine chronic conditions, including blood pressure, cholesterol, um, self-management, asthma, and that is available for all CHWs um, and health providers at no cost to them in the, in the state of New Mexico. So we encourage uh, folks to use that. And I believe also the Office of Community Health Workers gives some uh, continuing education credits to CHWs for um, participating in that. And my, my colleague is also on here, who's also our lead e-learning uh, trainer. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Heidi. Hi, I'm Heidi Fredeen. I'm an epidemiologist. I work with Constellation Consulting and I provide evaluation support. Thanks. Thanks, Heidi. And Laura, we'll come to you next. Hi, I'm Laura Feldman. Um, I have all the same information that Humphrey gave, but just to repeat, a senior research scientist at the Wyoming Survey and Analysis Center, which is at the University of Wyoming. And um, we do evaluations on a, a couple of few programs in the Department of Health. But right now we're here because of our evaluation on 1815, which is a um, heart disease and stroke and diabetes combined project. 
Okay, thanks, Laura. And Wayne? Oh, Wayne? You're, wait, you're muted, Wayne. There you go. I'm sorry, I was trying to, trying to press my space bar, but for some reason it wasn't uh, releasing the mute. Um, hi, I'm Wayne Honey, uh, epidemiologist with both the uh, Diabetes Prevention and Control Program and the Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention Programs. Uh, of late, so my, my primary role is to provide data analysis, data interpretation for those two. Uh, of late, I'm doing a lot of contract monitoring, so I monitor the WISAC contract, the evaluation contract. Uh, the PAC software contract, was, which is uh, some of you may know as uh, Workshop Wizard. Uh, so that's the uh, data repository referral system. And uh, um, Presbyterian Healthcare Services, a brand new contract that just began, and that's related to um, self-measured blood pressure monitoring. Okay, thanks so much, Wayne. Um, Luke, I will come to you next. Hey, everyone. I work with Humphrey and Laura at the Wyoming Survey and Analysis Center as the external evaluator for 1815. Thank you. And Robin, good to see you again. Hey there. I'm Robin Hetzler, and I'm the lead curriculum developer for the e-learning programs at MCD Public Health um, that my colleague described. Um, so just a little bit of a, a reminder, we provide the online professional development opportunities for CHWs and um, health care providers. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stacy Dalton. I am a, a pharmacist clinician with Presbyterian Medical Group or Presbyterian Healthcare Services in New Mexico. Um, I'm one of many pharmacist clinicians that are embedded in our primary care sites um, throughout the Albuquerque area. Uh, and I am working with uh, Kenny and the Department of Health on our recently executed contract about uh, improving our hypertension care pathway that will include um, promoting and using self-monitoring of blood pressure. Um, and there might also be a, a cholesterol management uh, component to it as well. Um, but I'm the lead pharmacist clinician for our group. And so I'm involved in improving the care pathway and working on the um, baseline data collection and also uh, ongoing data collection. Okay, thank you. Um, Edie, coming to you next. Hello, Edie Taylor. I am from Comagine Health. I'm an improvement advisor working on heart disease and self-monitored blood pressure program. Thank you. And Carrie? Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Thielen. I'm a program manager for Presbyterian Healthcare uh, Health Services in um, New Mexico. I am work with Community Health in Northern New Mexico. So I support Santa Fe and Rio Arriba counties. And in this role, I support our um, hospitals and clinics and um, connecting providers to community-based resources around chronic disease and healthy eating and assortment of other things. So um, thank you for having me. Sure, thanks for joining us. And Stephanie? Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Hedrick. I am a pharmacist at Duran Central Pharmacy. It's an independent pharmacy based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and we are just working with Kenny, uh, just got our contract signed. So working on our, our implementation plan for heart disease and stroke prevention program, managing um, our patients in the community pharmacy setting. Okay, thank you. Um, April? Oh, you already got me. April Salisbury oh. with Synchronous. I'm the Director of Onboarding and Training. Thank you. I will say the windows have moved around a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, so I appreciate your patience. Um, Alberta? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alberta, and I work at Comagine Health on the Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention um, contract with um, Kenny and Edie. Oh, and I'm a Associate Improvement Advisor. I always forget my title. Thank you. And Jill. Hi, 
Hi everyone, this is Jill. I work with the Diabetes Prevention and Control Program. I'm a nurse consultant and we work closely with Kenny and the Heart Disease Drug Prevention Program. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Lee. Hello, my name is Sarah Lee Vasquez and I work for, I'm a medical assistant at Amador Top Center. Thank you. Thanks. Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Vandegrift. I'm a clinical quality consultant with Presbyterian Healthcare Services and I, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I work with Stacey Dalton uh, and the pharmacist clinicians on their improvement efforts around our hypertension care pathways and uh, cholesterol management. Thank you. Doreen? Hi, everyone. I'm Doreen Conley. I'm the Diabetes Prevention Coordinator. I work at the Department of Health with Kenny and Jill and Dean and Amanda. Thanks, Doreen. And um, you're, just so you know, your uh, mic was kind of cutting in and out. Um, but um, I think we got, I think we got it. Yep, it's been happening all day. Okay. <laughs> um, going on to Jess. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm with the New Mexico Primary Care Association. Um, I'm a clinical quality specialist and a nurse with them, and I work with Kenny in the Department of Health on the Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention Program with our uh, FQHCs around the state. Thank you. Amanda? Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Herrera, and I'm with the Diabetes Prevention and Control Program. And um, I work with uh, a lot of the programs with Path South New Mexico Tools for Healthier Living Initiative, and I oversee several contracts for some of the people on the call today. And um, I'm primarily with marketing and communications for both programs, diabetes and heart disease. Okay, thank you. Valerie? Hello, my name is Valerie Quintana and I'm the Director of Community and Clinical Linkages at Presbyterians Community Health. And I oversee the management and implementation of all of our DOH grants, including the Chronic Disease Self-Management Programs, the Heart Disease Stroke and Prevention, and the Peer Support Specialist in the ED. And I'm also the Board President of the CDPC. Thank you. And Samantha. Hi, great to see everyone. Um, so I'm with Adam and Cecil. They went a while ago. So just to summarize um, some of the work that we do is working with health systems to look at um, target populations for blood pressure and stroke. Um, and I will say that um, another thing that we're working on is with Wayne and Doreen, um, we are collaborators through Workshop Wizard, which is under the PAC software contract. So I'm really excited to share between states um, as we're funded in both West Virginia and in New Mexico for the CDC grant. Awesome. And I think I got everybody. Um, I'll give it five seconds to see if I happen to miss anybody. Okay. So now we are pleased to have Kim Stavo, Program Manager for Presbyterian Healthcare, Healthcare Services Community Health, join us to discuss the collaboration between the YMCA and Presbyterian Wellness Referral Center. Kim's work with Presbyterian focuses on healthy food access, local food system related initiatives, and increasing community access to healthy eating and physical activity opportunities. Kim manages clinic and community organization connections to the Wellness Referral Center to support and expand community and clinical linkages across the central and regional delivery systems. Prior to her work at PHS, she held positions with the New Mexico Alliance for School-Based Health Care and the New Mexico Department of Health. She holds a BS in psychology and a Master of Public Health, both from Oregon State University. Please welcome Kim. Such a formal introduction. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I am going to share my screen. And we practiced this ahead of time. So hopefully, it will allow me to do it. I have a short presentation on our work um, with 
clinical referrals to the YBPSM program through the Wellness Referral Center. Can everyone see my screen? Just wanna yeah. double check. Okay, great. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay. So I am gonna start out by giving a brief kind of overview on the Healthy Care Wellness Referral Center. So folks kind of have an understanding of what this um, referral system looks like. So the Healthy Care Wellness Referral Center um, allows providers to um, refer patients for chronic disease, healthy eating, um, diabetes self-management, physical activity, um, a whole gamut of um, uh, categories um, for free virtual, right now they're virtual, free virtual programs for adults and children. Um, so these referrals also help to identify specific patient needs and the Wellness Referral Center and Community Health then work to identify partners and build additional resources to meet those needs. So the purpose of the Wellness Referral Center was to alleviate providers and other referring clinical staff from the pressures of needing to know all the programs and class details that are available to support their patients' wellness journey. Um, it was created by Presbyterian Community Health. It is operated by Adelante Development Center. Um, it, they, WRC is responsible for receiving referrals and connecting patients to classes and programs. Um, the WRC contacts and registers each referred patient. And I'm gonna show a little diagram of what this looks like visually in just a second. Um, they make reminder calls to the patients. The patients receive rewards or incentives for participation. And then partici participation um, information is then sent back to those referring providers if they request it and want it. Um, and so what this looks like in the real world is we have a wellness referral center epic referral order within our electronic health records. And so a provider identifies a particular need um, from a patient and they refer the patient to the wellness referral center. For this program that we're talking about specifically, we have a speed button for hypertension. And so if they have a patient who has high blood pressure, they can in that within that referral order, click hypertension. That referral is then sent to the Wellness Referral Center, which is operated at Adelante, and their team takes that referral and they contact the patient to discuss programs that are available um, and to see what works with the participant's schedule, with their language, with um, any other barriers to participation, whether that's transportation, so on and so forth. Um, once they're registered in a particular program, the participant receives this registration letter confirming the class or the program. They participate in that class or program. A WRC staff member follows up with them, um, asks them how it went. Patients receive um, incentives for program completion and then are also entered into raffles for larger prizes. Um, and then the WRC circles back around with them once a program is completed to see if there are any other programs that might fit their needs. Um, and so if, you, if anybody has questions about this whole process, we can feel free to ask after I'm finished with the presentation. So specifically for our work with DOH, heart disease and stroke prevention, um, is this hypertension self uh, blood pressure self-monitoring connection with the YMCA program. Um, so what we have um, done is, like I said, created that hypertension button. Um, and so the referring clinician can refer to the WRC for hypertension and then they connect them with the YMCA um, self-monitoring program. And I know Sarah is gonna talk in detail about that after I'm done. So I just have their flyer that we utilize. Um, for patients that are registered through the Wellness Referral Center in that program. So this is one of the pieces of information that a patient is sent once they're um, refer or registered in the program. Um, again, the WRC, the Wellness Referral Center is in our EPIC referral system. Um, and so it makes it really convenient and really easy for clinicians to utilize it. Um, and what we've also done is to eliminate barriers of participation in the self-monitoring program is blood pressure cuffs are included um, for folks who register for the program who need one. We don't want that to be a, a barrier for participation. Um, we just, I would say in at very end of August, um, 
had the hypertension button go live on our referral system. And we have since seen increased referrals for hypertension. So to date, we've had about 42 referrals and we're still doing um, ongoing outreach and education for our clinicians so that they know that that's there. Um, and um, we currently have registered 12, 13, 14, 15, 15, 17 folks, um, and that doesn't include November um, in the YMCA's program. Um, and just thinking through future, and I, I mentioned to Kenny that I would focus a little bit on the future is this um, provider flyer shows what other types of resources that we have, and a lot of them are related um, to heart disease and stroke prevention across the board. So we have our virtual nutrition cooking classes, we have all sorts of physical activity um, programs, we have the specifically the self-management education, so the chronic disease self-management programs, we have diabetes programs, and then of course you can see we have listed on here the YMCA um, blood pressure self-monitoring program. So this just gives you an idea what it looks like for the, um, on the clinician or the provider side, this is what we are educating them. So there's some programs that are more specific, like we really called out the YMCA's program. Um, and then there are others that are more broad. So we have several different types of yoga classes or several different types of walking and running programs. Um, so that is all I have in terms of that connection. And what we're really trying to do is make sure that our clinical providers have um, an easy ability to be able to refer their patients to a self-monitoring program, and specifically the YMCA is evidence-based self-monitoring program. So does anybody have any questions? And my information is here, and also my uh, colleague Valerie, who oversees all of this, is on the call too. So if there is a question that comes up that I cannot answer, she might be able to, or we can go back and find the answer for everybody. But if you so, have a question, oh, so sorry. I was just going to say, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat box, or if you want to open your mic and ask your question live, please feel free to go ahead. And so, Cecil, I think you were up. Yeah, I was. I was uh, going to say I was enjoyed the presentation, and we we're working with a very similar program in West Virginia. And you didn't mention this, or if you did, I missed it. Do you have um, people can self refer to this program, or is it through the provider um, process. Thank you for bringing that up. I did not mention it, but there is a self-referral option. Um, so there's a wellness referral center phone number that um, is placed on all of the YMCA flyers that are specific for this program. Um, and so if somebody was to see that or if one of our um, community clinics or um, community partners had this information and shared it, someone could self-refer. We also have a self-referral piece for if a friend or family member was referred through a clinician, you can have your family. So like, let's say your mom was referred and you would like to go with your mom and do the program as well. We do um, offer that and we call that self-referral too, but they're, they're kind of Hey, so, Valerie. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. So this is Josh. Um, so I guess I was going to ask um, where this flyer or who gets this flyer is it so people in the hospitals as well as your primary care clinics and then just like you said, whoever else sees it. But do they have to be a part of the Presbyterian family or insurance or, or just it's just a resource for anyone? So um, insurance, um, ability to pay, where you were seen, none of that comes into play in terms of actually participating in the program if you were referred through the Wellness Referral Center. Um, we have First Nations and First Choice um, are both of the two FQHCs here in town who are um, partners with the Wellness Referral Center who utilize it with the paper referral form as a clinical referral. Um, like Valerie mentioned, Paths to Health is, she mentioned that in the chat, um, is contract, the WRC is contracted with Paths to Health, which is a self-referral. Um, in terms of community partners, it, it varies in terms of who gets it. It's who we've been in contact with. So if that's something that this group is interested 
in receiving in terms of it wouldn't be that particular provider flyer, but our wellness referral center community health classes. So above and beyond just the wellness referral center, we have um, multitudes of community health classes that don't need a referral source or you don't have to go through the wellness referral center either. So if you have um, community members you're working with different groups that are interested in physical activity, healthy eating, any of those pieces, um, those are a self-referral through our, our web calendar, basically. So you don't actually have to have anybody send you to the Wellness Referral Center or call the Wellness Referral Center. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Sarah Lee is asking for your email. So if you want to pop that slide back up or you can put your email in the chat as well. Um, Valerie is also saying Casa de Salud is set up to refer. Yes, sorry, I forgot that one too. Thanks, Valerie. Okay, and we'll have um, additional Q&A time um, later. So, um, so thanks so much, Kim. And so now we are pleased to welcome Sarah Ukiley, the Director of Blood Pressure Self-Monitoring Program for the YMCA of Central New Mexico. She is also the YMCA's Association Group Exercise Director a NASM certified personal trainer and a certified yoga and spinning instructor. So you're not busy at all. The dog in. I'm sorry. <laughs> you let the dog will, in. And uh, Sarah will uh, share more about the YMCA's blood pressure and self monitoring program. So please welcome Sarah. Thank you. I'm on a presentation. I'm sorry. I can't talk to you right now, Maddie. I'm sorry. My daughter is asking me a question. So let me start uh, sharing my screen. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, I am the director of the YMCA's blood pressure self monitoring program. I'm going to do a little bit of overview of you know hypertension and the problem it poses. Um, I know I realize a lot of you are you know in the health care field. So you probably know a lot of this, but I wasn't sure. So I just wanted to kind of go over it briefly. So let's see. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. So hypertension or high blood pressure is, we call it the silent killer because there's a lot of, um, a lot of people that have it and don't realize it because there's no, there's no symptoms. Um, that flyer that Kim shared earlier, I don't know if you noticed the, the top of it said one in three Americans have hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, the Surgeon General just put out a, um, a press release last month. And uh, now, it, and according to that press release, nearly half of American adults have high blood pressure um, and only one in four have it under control. Um, and it particularly affects um, uh, black and Hispanic um, people at a higher rate, 80% of black and Hispanic Americans have uncontrolled blood pressure. Um, the good news is that people can do something about it. And so that's why the Y developed the, the blood pressure self monitoring program. Okay. So the Y developed this program to help adults lower their blood pressure and manage it. Um, it is a four month program. So, and the way that we run it at our Y, and this differs from other YMCAs around the country, we do a rolling admission. So when somebody wants to start the program, that's when they can start. We don't, we don't wait and have them start at the beginning of the month or make them wait for the next cohort. So we just do a rolling admission because we, we realized when we started the program that that was what worked best for us in our population. Um, so it teaches folks how to measure their blood pressure at home, um, and they can meet with a, they meet with a healthy heart ambassador twice a month to get their blood pressure checked. Um, and we are doing that virtually now because of COVID. And then we also have our participants attend a nutrition seminar once once a month. And these are um, focused on uh, ways to change people's diets in order to reduce sodium in their diet and just have a healthier, um, healthier diet to bring their blood pressure down. 
So the goals, number one, reduce their blood pressure um, and have better blood pressure management. And then also increase awareness of the triggers that elevate their blood pressure and then also um, improve their knowledge uh, and develop either healthy eater eating habits and lifestyle habits. Okay. So the eligibility for our program, um, they must be 18 and over. They have to have been diagnosed with high blood pressure. They have to not have experienced a recent cardiac event and that's within the last 12 months. They cannot have atrial fibrillation or other arrhythmias and they cannot be at risk for lymphedema. So um, Kim was talking about how, um, you know, Presbyterian is referring patients or participants into our program. So we're, we're looking to create more partnerships with other um, organizations in New Mexico. And so we've kind of developed two different kinds of, of uh, partnerships. So the type that we have with Presbyterian is a referral type. And then we also have developed a couple of partnerships with some organizations that are more self-sustaining. So our self-sustaining partnerships are with the Office of African-American Affairs and the Water Authority in uh, Albuquerque, Bernalillo County Water Authority. And we are looking to develop more of these partnerships statewide in the future. So we really wanna expand the program and make it available to, to New Mexicans all over the state. So the way our referral partnerships work, um, we come up with a MOU or memorandum of understanding or an agreement um, between the two, the Y and our referring partner. And then the referring partner directs participants into the program. And then we provide the Healthy Heart Ambassador office hours, the nutrition seminars. So we do all the work um, associated with the program. And then we, bill, we would bill the referring partner and provide updates as needed information if they want um, any type of reporting on the results of the program, we can, we can do that with our, um, with our re reporting system. Okay. So for self-sustaining partnerships, um, these work a little bit differently. We again, establish that MOU with, our, with the partner um, and then they identify staff within their organization that they'd like to have trained as healthy heart ambassadors. Um, and then what we need to do is establish those staffs as YMCA volunteers so that they can actually take the healthy heart ambassador training. Um, and then we provide support and oversight to the partner. So we, we help them out with getting them set up with the training, um, help them with any marketing materials they might need. We also do oversight and make sure that they are providing the program in the way that that, that is uh, mandated by the YMCA. Okay. So this is a quick overview of the Healthy Heart Ambassador training through the YMCA. Uh, the YMCA has a, uh, has a, an online learning portal called LCDC and they offer, most of these classes are just e-learning, self-paced kind of things. Um, there is one, the, the actual healthy heart ambassador, the, the, um, the, the fourth one over that one is, it used to be a live in-person training. They've now put it online on zoom. So it's still kind of a live training, but it's virtual now. Um, so that's, that's kind of an overview of the amount of time that it takes to do each training and the cost of the training. So from start to finish, it's about $100 to train a, a healthy heart ambassador. So benefits of our program, it's a simple but effective evidence-based program. It's a fairly short time frame, four months. We have other, the Y has other um, wellness programs that are much longer. So this one is, is short in comparison to some of the other programs that the Y offers. We can deliver it in person or virtually, and we've been doing a lot more virtually now in this new, new time of COVID. Um, and the Healthy Heart Ambassador training um, can be completed in less than seven hours. So it's fairly quick to get people up and running as Healthy Heart Ambassadors. There are some challenges and obstacles for us. Um, you know, number one is just to get folks to realize how uh, dangerous having high blood pressure is. 
And I think I saw recently that they're starting to lower what's considered normal, high, um, normal blood pressure ranges. So more people are going to be diagnosed with hypertension because they're going to fall above those, those new ranges. Um, we are, you know, slowly building up participation in the program, but we, um, we started it about a year ago and it started out fairly slowly and, you know, we are starting to get momentum, but we would really like to, um, you know, increase the participation and just get the word out and get folks to really take it seriously and do something about it. Um, another obstacle is for some folks, lack of access to technology or connectivity for some participants for virtual program participation. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to provide the program, you know, statewide, but if people don't have, you know, access to you know, Wi-Fi or internet, or they don't have a device, a computer, a smartphone or a tablet, then they can't do that virtual participation. Um, and then right now we are limited. We have a limited number of our trained Healthy Heart Ambassadors. We are in the process of training some more. So hopefully we will have some more within the next few months. And that's all for me. So I'm ready to take your questions if you like. Sarah, um... I'll actually get things started for you. So Wayne has a question. Um, he wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the restrictions, the AFib, um, the lymphedema. And he said, mm -hmm. thanks, excellent presentation. Um, so the restrictions that were set up, um, that, those were um, given to us by the y, YUSA when they developed the program. I'm not 100% I'm not sure why. I think it has to do it has something to do with when they're judging the success of the program, they maybe don't wanna have people that have those conditions in the cohort, which might alter the, the, you know, the, the outcomes of how successful the program is. So that's my guess. I don't really know for sure why they, why they put those restrictions on us, but that's, that's my best guess. Yeah, that was kind of my assumption about what that, what, where that was coming from. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Just a, a very, very quick sort of secondhand testimonial. I don't know that he participated in this particular program, but a friend of mine was diagnosed with life-threatening hypertension a few years ago and really took it seriously, young father of young children, and in the course of a year, lost 100 pounds made significant changes to his diet, was able to come off of his hypertension meds. And for years now, it's probably five years, he's been within normal, healthy hypertension or blood pressure ranges, all by just personal behavior changes. I mean, it's, it's one great. of those, yeah, it's one of those few conditions that you really can have profound impact by behavior change. Thank you. That's, that's great. I, I love to hear stuff like that. We've got yeah. a couple of, a couple of other questions. Um, and then I will um, open it up to the group as well. Um, so Stacy is asking, does the ambassador set a goal BP with the patient or are they directed to their healthcare provider regarding a goal? No, we don't set a goal um, and we are actually trained to, you know, when, when we take somebody's blood pressure and we see the number, we're trained to not react, you know, like, you know, like, whoa. So what we normally do is we take their blood pressure and we show them a chart. Um, and it's, I think it's from the American Heart Association, I think. So I'll show it, I'll show it to you. I don't have it up on my screen, but um, and we ask the participant, you know, to find their, what their range is on this chart. And it says, you know, normal, elevated, you know, hypertension stage one, stage two, and then hypertensive crisis. So we try not to, you know, react or, or set a goal. We just want them to just get into the habit of checking it like once a week. And, you know, the study that we base this program on it was just that it was getting people to check it on a regular basis. It's similar to the, the same phenomenon when people weigh themselves, they tend to lose weight when they weigh themselves on a regular basis, um, just to bring that awareness. And then hopefully that awareness will 
then lead them to make the necessary changes and then also providing that support with our nutrition seminars so that they have the, the tools they need to start to reduce the sodium in their diet. And, and then, you know, we also talk about increasing, you know, their physical activity. I mean, we are the why, you know, so we're all about working out and, uh, and getting fit. Awesome. We do have a couple more questions in the chat, but I want to uh, give um, attendees the, the opportunity if they want to open their mic and ask you a question directly, they certainly can. Uh, yeah, this is Josh again. I know um, we kind of had a meeting before you all started uh, this program, um, but I would like to offer you know any resources that we have available um, to you and, and to your program. You know, we have a lot of really great infographics on how to check your blood pressure at home, you know, both feet on the floor, you know, all those little tips. Uh, and we have a really nice infographic that uh, you're more than welcome to utilize and pass out as you uh, provide blood pressure monitors to your uh, participants. And then, you know, any other resource or, or handouts that we have, um, you know, we'll be more than happy to share them with you um, as you uh, continue with this program. So um, just let me know uh, if you're interested. Yeah, that would be great. Would like. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Jill actually had, I think, probably more of a comment. She was just mentioning the lymphedema and the, the swelling in the arms and that um, sh you shouldn't take blood, blood pressure in in that arm. And so I'm guessing that's probably one of the reasons why you guys don't. <laughs> do yeah, <that>. yeah. <laughs> um, Samantha is asking, uh, do the healthcare providers receive outcomes from the program? And if they are out of range, um, are they notified? Is their provider notified? Sorry. Um, so we currently, we don't do that. Um, we can set it up to do that. So if we have a partner that wants to get that, um, th that information back, um, we can do that. But right now, um, we're not we're not set up to do that currently. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, I just raised that question only because there was one clinic for sure in your state that was interested in that. Like if we, you know, decide that there are some that have uncontrolled hypertension, could they be able to have those results if they joined one of these types of programs? And I know that we talked with Josh and Kenny a little bit about this and making sure that we have the right resources in those communities is great, but just wondering about this program and how it works. And, you know, it'd be really nice, even if, you know, it's not part of it right now, if, if a patient wanted to share it with their provider, maybe having that printout or something to take back to their next visit, I'm sure would be really helpful to them to show their yeah. provider. Yeah, and what we do is we give all of our participants a little logbook. Um, you know, we have a couple of different versions of them. One's kind of like a passport sized, you know, that folds in half, and then one's like a wallet card um, where they can write down their blood pressure uh, numbers. And we do encourage them to take that with them and when they go see their provider, so their provider can can look at it. Because what we get a lot of is um, we get people that come into the program and when we take their blood pressure, we try to make them really calm and comfortable and, you know, have a conversation, relax them, maybe do a little short mindfulness. I'm a yoga instructor, so I'm all about like meditation and mindfulness. Um, so, and, you know, a lot of times when people go see their, their healthcare provider, you know, we, you know, it's that white coat syndrome where people are just anxious being at the doctor's office. You know, they, they, you know, it tends to have their, their blood pressure elevated a little bit abnormally when they're at the doctor. So if we can make them calm and comfortable and take their blood pressure when they're relaxed, and then, you know, we, we get them into the habit of doing it at home where they're also more relaxed. And then they bring that information with them to their provider. So the provider can see, okay, Maybe your blood pressure is a little high today while you're here in the office, but I see that, you know, it's been, you've been tracking it and it's been, you know, coming down or, you know, whatever. So we do encourage them to share that information with their provider. Thank you. And I think that answers um, Cecil's question as well. I actually had a question about how you have dealt with um, HIPAA in light of um, technology and Zoom and all of that. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so it's a little bit of a gray area with that, with Zoom, because we are doing um, some of the, uh, we are doing the, um, the office hours on Zoom, um, you know, and we, we checked with YUSA as to whether that was, you know, allowed under HIPAA and our understanding was that we were, we were okay to do that. Um, I think Zoom does have like a, a HIPAA version of it, but it's like prohibitively hey, expensive. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I think it was background noise. Oh, oh okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, it's a little bit of a gray area, but I mean, it's it's you know we're we're dealing in kind of unusual times, and um, we're you know we're just trying to do things the best we can with under the circumstances. Okay, thank you. This um, is April. If if I could just offer, um, Synchronous recently adopted that HIPAA compliant version of Zoom. And um, the way they price that, it's it's like um, a flat fee per month, and you get ten users with that flat fee. Um, the main difference is that you have to have a business associates agreement signed, and then they turn on additional um, security features in the background. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Any other questions for Sarah at the moment? So one of the purposes of this collaborative is to provide our participants and attendees with the learning, communication, and collaboration opportunities to support the heart disease and stroke prevention program goals. Um, Constellation's Erin Marshall will now lead a facilitated discussion on today's topic. Erin, turn it over to you. Thank you. So uh, my name is Erin Marshall, and I'm a third year law student at the UNM School of Law. Um, past president of the Student Health Law Association and a student member of the New Mexico State Bar Health Law Section. Um, I have a long history in um, dealing with uh, cardiovascular and, and cerebrovascular uh, issues, both in policy and in clinical settings. So I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really excited to be a part of this uh, collaborative. Uh, right now, I, I just found out that uh, my uh, article on maternal health is going to be accepted by the uh, National Birth Rights Bar Association. And, uh, and one of the findings in that that I'll be presenting is that uh, approximately 60% of maternal mortality could be prevented. And the top three indicators are all cardiovascular, the top which is a uh, hypertensive disorder. <clears throat> so, um, so it's a huge you know, impact when we talk about awareness and, uh, and what, all you, um, what we can do and what all of you are doing is just so critical. So um, enough about me though, I really wanna hear from all of you. Uh, I'm as a facilitator, hopefully not gonna do all the talking. So please uh, unmute yourself. This is to be a discussion and you know, I may call on people if, if uh, you know, and, and I will be monitoring the chat. Hold on, let me open the chat as I say that. I will be monitoring the chat and, uh, <clears throat> and welcome all input. So I'd like to just uh, you'll know, open up the floor and talk a little bit about you know what your current efforts are uh, in in your work to uh, to do this kind of you know to do this kind of outreach you know how are you identifying um, your clients and and how are you referring them and maybe to share a little bit about what your successes and what your challenges have been. I've done everybody talk at once. So one of the things that I love and I've talked a lot about, worked a lot with is, um, uh, oh, and Valerie Quintana is in the waiting room again. And I know she's looking at starting a program. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things I love about uh, New Mexico is that we're very innovative in how we reach people uh, due to the rural nature of our state and our, you know, uh, provider shortage. So one of the things that's been very successful here is working with, you know, community providers, community health workers, uh, promotoras, uh, pharmacists, community pharmacists, I think are, are uh, very underutilized in New Mexico for outreach. And of course, we have uh, independent practicing uh, nurse practitioners here as well. So um, you know, do you have any ideas about how we might 
look at innovative models or, or partners uh, that uh, maybe are being underutilized. Sandy, do you want to talk a little bit about the CHWs? You know, I, I'm no expert, and so I'm not comfortable um, doing that. I apologize. Just a beginner. Okay. Uh, this is April from Synchronous, and I am brand new. I'm, I'm just learning about our, our contract as well, but I know some of the things that we're doing is um, with the renewed funding that we have with um, HSD and the contracts we have, we are reaching out to lots of organizations to try to share more information um, through the Health Information Exchange with the goal of um, meeting standards that have been set by the the United States for exchanging information that would include more things like uh, hypertension um, monitoring to make that information more accessible. And um, so next, I believe it's next year or the year after that, um, electronic health records are going to be capable of exchanging a lot more um, categories of data than they do now. And so we're reaching out to expand use of the health information exchange and also to expand the types of information that are available in it. Uh, this is Josh again. Um, we work a lot with uh, FQHCs throughout the state, federally qualified health centers. Um, the American Heart Association has specific uh, clinical uh, ambulatory programs uh, around uh, hypertension, around diabetes and cholesterol, in which uh, we provide uh, free resources for these clinics to utilize uh, with their patients around these measures. Um, these resources are handouts um, that providers uh, or medical staff can uh, give their patients on how to manage their blood pressure, their cholesterol, diabetes uh, recipes, physical activity ideas, all these really great things um, that, um, again, medical staff can provide uh, their patients. We also have uh, trainings uh, and webinars associated with these programs uh, to which, again, the medical staff can view um, the latest uh, research and um, scientific studies or papers that are um, out. Um, and then again, any, any webinars that we have uh, you know, with our partners as well, um, medical staff can um, view those and, and watch those. We have a monthly uh, newsletter and uh, information that will go out to participants. Um, and then these programs are also recognition programs. Um, so if a clinic uh, has a control rate of 70% or better, um, they would be recognized as a gold level uh, clinic uh, and that they get uh, local and national accolades and awards um, you know, uh, being recognized for uh, those achievements. And if they don't reach those, um, they still get some uh, awards and different things like that. So uh, a lot of really great things that we have available, um, not only for federally qualified health centers, but um, those are the ones that we have worked with uh, in the past and again, across the state of New Mexico. So that's uh, one of the things that uh, we are doing as it relates to kind of this work. That's great. Um, well, and I know we have a couple people on here who work with community health workers and I'm thinking, um, let's see, I know, um, let's see, is it Robin and Elizabeth? Yeah, are sure. Still on? Could you talk well, a little bit about that? Sure, this is a, Elizabeth and then I can have Robin if she wants to jump in. Um, as I put the link in the in the chat to the the um, CHW training and again it's op it's open access to anybody in, in New Mexico. And what I wanted to mention in there is we really try very hard to um, teach, you know, communication skills and culturally appropriate ways of working with your clients, your community, your, your patients. Um, and in particular, we have tools you can download, you know, how to ask an open-ended question. You know, for example, if somebody is smoking, we're not just gonna say, you know, smoking kills you and you really need to stop smoking, right? I mean, so it, it may be, more of a motivational way of talking and, and, and saying, you, you know, you, you must be getting something from smoking and, you know, can you tell me a little bit about that? And maybe we can think of some other things, you know, so just really good relational skills and ways um, community health workers can work with the 
their their clients. And again, a lot of downloadable tools, a lot of uh, video vignettes and, and uh, things um, on there that can be utilized. So I don't know, Robin, if you wanted to, to add a little bit to uh, add a little bit more. I think you pretty much covered um, our trainings and what they offer. Um, I would just say that as far as promotion and getting the word out of, of what we're offering, you know, the partnership with um, New Mexico Department of Health and the Office of Community Health Workers um, definitely help to get the word out to folks um, and make sure that community health workers and promotores and community health uh, representatives uh, in New Mexico are aware of this uh, this opportunity um, that is free for them, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, and also CEUs are offered uh, for the after the completion of, of all the modules. So, um, and they're available in English and Spanish. So, um, just want to make sure that folks are aware of that. Great, and then you know, I know we had or we had somebody. I'm not sure if she's been uh, able to rejoin us from Española, who is looking at doing some outreach or starting a program. Um, is it Veronica? Is she still on with us? Valerie. Valerie Quintana? Uh, Valerie. Valerie, are you still on with us? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Could you share a little bit with what's going on in Espanola? Um, so we have a peer support specialist in Espanola, um, but with community health in um, we're in Albuquerque. We have a community health worker, Edna Hutchinson, who you, some of you might be familiar with. And she is um, providing, <coughs> excuse me, the classes to, that you need to get certified as a CHW. And we do that through Presbyterian with, uh, we're sanctioned by the Department of Health, Office of Community Health Workers, and those classes are free and they're virtual. So anyone from around the state can attend. And I can put Edna's uh, email in the chat. Um, okay, yeah, that would be great. So for those of you who may be uh, looking at exploring, um, starting a program, um, and we only have a few minutes left here, but I'd love to hear about, you know, we've talked a little bit about the resources. I've heard a lot about the resources uh, through the Heart Association and through the CHW program. Um, but how do we bring people to those resources? How do we uh, establish a program? Um, you know, what, are, what are you looking at as far as um, exploring the readiness in your own organization or community? Um, and what kind of resources might you need um, to launch such a program? And can I ask a clarifying question? This is Kim from Presbyterian Community Health. Are you talking specifically right now about community health worker programs? Or are you talking about all of the different, you know, heart disease, stroke prevention programs? I think I got a little confused there between two things. Right. So, no, I appreciate that. So, no, I think we're talking a little bit more broadly um, about, um, you know, starting a program looking at, you know, how do you identify patients who are potentially at high risk for hypertension? And then how do we look at self-monitoring programs? Um, it's Kenny. I mean, I, I can talk a little bit uh, just like from the state perspective about the support that that I think we can offer. And I, I hope I don't speak here for, for Sarah. Um, I feel like New Mexico is really at the forefront of of the YBPSM. So, I mean, YBPSM programs are available in other states. Um, one of the things that CDC has come out and said is that they want to make the Y curriculum available um, under our federal funding uh, to organizations that are ready. But as you heard from, from Sarah, I mean, there's already a mechanism that they, they've established to um, expand the program outside of the Y organization. So I think those are really two good resources if there's anyone interested. I mean, they can contact me, they can contact Sarah, at least from, from those starting points. I mean, I think there are benefits to each of those path, paths. Um, and, you know, we also just want to be cognizant, I guess, about um, the wise 
capacity at this point, right? I'm always concerned yeah. about that, and I'm always concerned <laughs> yes. about uh, volunteering, Sarah, to do more work. But you know, there really are two paths. There's a CDC path that that you know they're they're asking for uh, names of individuals and organizations that are ready to or or potentially ready to offer like a YBPSM program. And then I think there's the the Sarah route, and then probably the third option is um, a health system could start or implement a policy for self-measured blood pressure with clinical support. Um, so there's there's different paths depending on what an organization wants to do. And Sarah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I think you covered it. I mean, like I said in the presentation, you know, we are looking to create more partnerships. Um, you know, either with with referrals or have people start up kind of their own little satellite versions of the program with their own healthy heart ambassadors. So, um, you know, we've we've developed both of those types of partnerships, and I think they are. You know, we're still kind of learning. It's you know, we just started with with Presbyterian in August, and you know, it's slowly getting going and you know, Office of African American Affairs and the, the Water Authority folks, they're also um, ver starting very slowly, but, you know, we, we really do want to make this available statewide. So, you know, we're, I think we can, you know, start to ramp things up and, and get more folks to get control of their blood pressure because it's, it's so important. And I'll piggyback on what Sarah said from the Presbyterian standpoint. Um, we have clinicians who are saying this is a need and having a self-monitoring program is a need, especially in Northern New Mexico, because we do have the partnership now here in the central delivery system in the Albuquerque area. Um, so we, you know, I've talked to Sarah, we've talked to Kenny, like what does that look like for us to refer patients from Española to the Albuquerque program? And, you know, because of capacity, we wanna see how it goes in Albuquerque first. But if, if folks have, connections with community organizations in Northern New Mexico who would want to, like Kenny mentioned, do the CDC route or even be trained through the, you know, the only YMCA in Española is the teen center. Um, and then to bring up another piece of that is we've had clinicians refer um, patients who are under 18 who can't participate in the WISE program because um, there's just 18 and over. So if anybody has local resources on blood pressure, self-monitoring programs for youth um, in that teen kind of population, that would also be really helpful. I don't know. I don't have any answers to your questions, Erin, but I have lots of <laughs> requests from folks. But that's great. I mean, that's what we're trying to get to is what do people need? So questions are as good as answers, maybe even better. Um, and, and that kind of leads to my, uh, my last question here, and that is, you know, for those of uh, for those of you who are attending who are contractors have contractors under the heart disease and stroke prevention program, how do you see um, you know your contract or your scope of work um, supporting uh, self monitoring efforts like this? This um, this is Elizabeth. I just put in the also in the chat that we do have a complete BP online training program. Now this is not specific for community health workers. This is for, it could be medical assistants, nursing, physicians, and there are four modules on there, but one is very in-depth around self-measured blood pressure monitoring. And there's a big section on it, how to, how to start a loaner program, how to set up quality control in your practice, how to you know inventory them, how to make sure they stay clean, how to make sure, and also a piece about actually you know, involving the patient. So they bring their monitor in, you're making sure they know how to use it right so that you're getting accurate measurements. Um, so there's there's that that may be uh, useful for the group. And then the other thing I was going to mention, and I think Erin, somebody had said this on the group that they've been in, in, engaging pharmacists in the role. And I think pharmacists mm -hmm. could have a significant role. And there may be some of that going on in New Mexico, but they certainly could have a role in that around, you know, better um, uh, medication management too, as well. So I just mentioned those those couple things. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. My experience is uh, community pharmacists want to be more involved and, and are typically very uh, underutilized. And they're out in our communities. So that is definitely uh, uh, something to explore. You know, we, we also had uh, 
blood pressure uh, self-monitoring program um, in which we work with organizations or in employers uh, across the state um, to, to set up and, and start a self-monitoring blood pressure program. Uh, we had an online system or we do have an online tracking system or tool that uh, we utilize uh, in which a participant would register and then they're able to securely keep their um, blood pressure readings uh, in, in our system, in our portal, uh, as well as a lot of other additional resources that they can um, get and, and look at uh, on that website. Uh, but specifically, we've been working with the city of Albuquerque uh, for a number of years uh, with their employee wellness program. And uh, with this program, the city actually under the Barry administration purchased about 90 blood pressure monitors in which they set up uh, self-monitoring blood pressure stations uh, across all uh, uh, city buildings um, in different areas where their employees would have access to check their blood pressure on a regular basis. Uh, we're also working with Bernalillo County and the Water Authority to, to do exactly this. So in, in all county city uh, buildings, there are uh, stations. Um, so again, their employees can um, to check their, their blood pressure. So we do this with a number of uh, different organizations. Um, we've done it with Las Cruces Public Schools. It's also implementing uh, this program. And in some cases we can loan, or now you know it's a different circumstances, but uh, in the past we were able to loan blood pressure monitors for the four month period um, to see if, you know, how effective it would be or if, if it would be used um, but in some cases, like city, Bernalillo County, they purchase their own blood pressure monitors um, in which, you know, they, they're theirs and they can set them up and be used, um, you know, as much and as often as they, they want. But, you know, that's another thing that we've done and that we're doing um, as it relates to blood pressure, so. That's very good. Thank you, Josh, for sharing. And, uh, and if we don't have anybody else who uh, would like to um, to share, I see some questions coming in for Josh. Hey, Aaron. Uh, yes, Adam. Yeah, Aaron, just real quick, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Adam Baus with WVU. I would just say quickly that in terms of how, you know, our office could contribute to the greater good, and I love the work that's being outlined here, and we want to do all that we can to, to be a support. I think that we could, um, the, health, the health systems level work that we do would give opportunity for providers and clinics to have a, a reminder basically of what their risk pool looks like. You know, so how many patients are we really talking about? We can help them understand in terms of diagnosed and undiagnosed hypertension like what those patients look like demographically, um, any social de determinants of health data that can be layered on to better understand those populations, and then start to queue up those individuals to be referred to the great programs and resources out there in New Mexico. So, you know, identifying the risk populations, getting them referred, understanding how many are going to those programs and then looking at the outcomes of those patients over time. So say you have 100 people that have referred and 80 of them went, what are the outcomes of those 80 individuals over time? And how, how does their blood pressure look now compared to prior to going to the program? So we can pitch in with you know, outcomes evaluation. Um, so yeah, excited. Great, well, thank you, Adam. All right, and, uh, and if we don't have anybody else who's queued to share, then uh, I will just say thank you so much, everybody, for, for being here and attending and participating in this. I think there's a, a lot of opportunity to move this forward, and I'll turn this back over. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for your attendance and participation today, and special thanks to our presenters, Kim and Sarah. Um, before you all go, if you can complete the poll that just popped up on your screen, we would appreciate it. This poll is anonymous and will certainly help us with our QI efforts moving forward. Um, Kenny, do you have anything else to add today? Um, oh, I'm not oh, muted. Good. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, we appreciate everyone being here. Um, 
you know, going forward, uh, so a website has been created or a web page, I should say. And so that's nmhealthequity.org uh, PHC, and it's up on your screen. And so we'll be posting information, updates, resources uh, related to some of the conversations that we're having. And um, we'll be launching discussion boards as well. So look, we're looking forward to that as well, because, you know, an hour and a half seemed like a long time and it took up most of our time. So sometimes too, when we get out of the meeting, we think of something that we didn't think about while we were all sitting together. So uh, Suzanne will be sending, Constellation Consulting will be sending that information out. And again, um, we'll be doing at least one more meeting um, like this. Uh, we're planning for February, 2021. And uh, we look forward to everyone uh, joining us back here then. Suzanne, anything else? That covers it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye thank you. Evening. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thanks for facilitating, Suzanne. Yeah, sure. thank you. Great meeting. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you guys. Do you want to debrief? Well then, I'm going to stop recording.